Wow. Those are great questions, Natasha. It's it's <laughs> it's really interesting. And I think that everything in life is about um the balance, to find the balance between light and darkness, isn't it? It's like even in our private lives, we have to find the balance between our unconscious and conscious and about the hidden parts of our life, our intimacy, and also um, what we want to show to others. And also in literature, for sure, it's that. We have to, to put to the light um, what uh, are normally hidden, things that are normally hidden, like madness, for instance, or, or very um, violence. Because um, yeah, novel it's 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 a place where we can look at them, have a look at them with a certain distance, and we can uh, reflect on that and and take our time in, instead of being included or in the middle of the turmoil where we normally live, and just step a little bit backwards and and look at life like this. So I wanted also because the story is so, so painful. Um, and it was certainly, it was painful to me too, that I wanted to find the balance, not getting very heavy in the prose, but just compensate the heaviness of the story with a, with a style that is more light and more, um, how, how would I say? It more, maybe more um, plain or simple. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the sources of consolation as well. So, I think the sources of consolation, and now you're asking that they found its friendship, most of all, first sure. of all. I think it's a, it's a book on friendship too, not only on motherhood, but also on. on on friendship and and compassion for sure, but not like something we give to the other generously, but also as a practice um, that allows us to connect. Connection saves us, you know, when we when we feel connected to others and we feel that we are not alone carrying a burden, but many of us are experiencing something similar. I think that Alina found an enormous source of consolation. She first looked into other things like shopping, <laughs> compulsive shopping, but then she realized little by little that what actually gave her consolation was to find people in the same situation she was finding herself, like this website, listencephaly.org, where she found a lot of parents who were as lost as she was and just, being honest and not trying to give like a very smiling appearance, but just saying we are in the middle of uh, pain and suffering and we don't know how to face it. So just having that, it, it's a lot, I think. Well, I love what you say about the practice of friendship, you know, not just not just doing what comes naturally, but actually working at making the friendship work, you know, do what it's supposed to do. And I noticed at the be, you know, at the beginning of the novel when, um, you know, after Alina tells Laura that she's planning to have a baby, and Laura's a little upset because, you know, she thought that they were, you know, were both going to um, choose not to have children. Um, Alina makes the effort to keep getting in touch with Laura. She keeps making, she keeps calling her and calling her, even when Laura doesn't respond. And finally, they do get back together. And, and I love that idea that friendship is something that you have to work on in the same way that you have to work at other things. Sure. So Laura's observations of the strange behavior of two pigeons nesting on her balcony serve as a counterpoint to the human drama of the novel. And it occurs to me that, and we've touched on this a little bit already, you were talking about how the language, you know, you you gravitated toward a plainer and um, um, simpler language. Um, and it occurred to me that some of that simplicity um, has a little bit of a scientific element. Um, and 
I thought of it first because of the way that Laura watches the the pigeons, and then she you know discovers some some scientific background and explaining their strange behavior. Um, but is that scientific inflection intentional? And do you think of the novel in some sense as a laboratory of human behavior? Uh, and is there something to be gained from turning a cool eye on subject matter that's often so emotional? Yes, I want it to be yeah, cool, the style to be cool and, and a little bit detached as well because I didn't want to give the, the reader the impression that he was being manipulated to a very sentimental and dramatic thing that where he was or she was forced to, to, to cry and to feel really bad and just wanted to present the reader the facts. Okay, this is what happened. That's what Alina told me. This is what I saw. So the reader is free to feel whatever he or she wants to or can feel. And yeah, otherwise I, I think that it would be a little bit too much pushy or even blackmailed. And, and, and I never wanted to give that, that impression because it wasn't my aim. There is a, an example of that that I really like and it, which inspired me a lot. It's a uh, French author, Maïlise Kerangal, Men the Living. Um, it's a novel with a very, very painful story, which is told in a very detached way as well. And I to myself, this is what I want to achieve. This is what I want. I don't want to push anyone to feel it, anything, you know? So that was important for me. And it was certainly an inspiration. And also, but the, 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 the scientific details, I owe that to, to my friend, Amelia, that when she told me the story or her part of the story or her vision of the story, she always went back to these scientific details because at least in the beginning, she was re, 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 relying, relying a lot on, on them. She wanted, she, that, that was the only certainty she had, what the doctors told her. And then little by little, she, had, she, she realized that there was no certainty at all in, in those conclusions that she had to discover who Ines actually was and what, what was her potential and the things she wanted or could do and, and achieve if she wanted or not do therapy and when and how how to relate to her little daughter to to get to know her really so that was very inspiring for me and for sure I wanted to talk about it and I also speaking about darkness and light there was some something else that uh, that was very inspiring it, and it was the way this family this couple managed to come out from pain and what normally we call darkness, which is suffering and not knowing at all what we are going to do, despair, for instance. And, and they managed to transform it, not, not the circumstances they have. They didn't transform the circumstances because Ines is still affected with its condition and she still has lysencephaly and micro lysencephaly, but the way they looked at it and, and they managed to, to transform their, their situation into something meaningful for, for them. They, they managed somehow to find a meaning in that uh, that gives them strength, strength and hope and what we normally call light, right? So that was very beautiful. And I wanted to tell that story and share it with everyone. I think it was heroic. And also nothing, no one taught them. They didn't, uh, they, they didn't know what to do. And it was little by little staying like a, a small step each day that they realized how to do that. So. It really is fascinating how wrong the doctors were. And, you know, every time they think that they've understood something about what's wrong 
with Ines, um, they realize that the doctors really have no idea. And I love the way they teach themselves how to know what she needs. Um, and I and I and I and I think that your the novel really does um, does uh, show very well how that becomes a source of strength for them. Um, and I, I will say too that although you know you do have you do get this coolness, you also have a very empathetic. Um, there, there's a, there's this very strong feeling of empathy that you get from the narrator's voice and from the the relationships between the characters. So I love the balance of the coolness and the empathy. Um, Thank Two of the most interesting characters in the novel for me were um, Alina's nanny, Marle um, Marlene, or Marlene, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and Laura's neighbor, Dor Doris, or Doris. Um, I feel like I could say them in English or Spanish. Um, so is it Marlene, really, is, is how you would say it? Yeah. I don't know, actually. <laughs> I just see it written, so I think of, you know, I don't know exactly. I think of Marlene as being such an English name. I haven't heard it in Spanish before. Um, but I'll say Marlene. So Marlene is hired to take care of baby, baby Ines and becomes intensely attached to her in this kind of, you know, fascinating and crazy way. And um, Doris can't handle her young son, Nicolas, and she surrenders more and more of his care to Laura so that Laura becomes kind of a mother to Nicolas um, in some ways, although not entirely. So there are a number of, uh, of intimate scenes between the mothers and the children, the adults and the children in the novel. But for me, some of the most surprising and intense scenes were between Al Alina and Marlene and Doris and Laura. Um, would you say that the novel is about caretaking in general as much as it is about mother-child relationships and about the adults caring for each other? Um, and do you intentionally shift the focus away from Ines and Nicolas, the baby and the little boy, um, to the relationships between the adult women as the novel draws to a close? I really have the strong feeling that, that that was intentional and that the women were, you know, the women are, the novel begins with the women without children and the novel ends um, with the women having, you know, relationships of their own, new relationships of their own. Um, so go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, it was surprising in a way for me too in the beginning. And then I realized that all the story was uh, driven to that scene or to that moment. And it's, that's something that I really like in the writing process when the story tells you, you have to write this down and this is where the story goes, you know, by itself, by its natural movement. And you just are surprised and want to just let you um, draw to that. So, and then I, I realized that, yeah, everything was pushing the story to that scene. Then also, yeah, caretaking is really important. And I think that is um, like the more powerful revolution we can, we can start in an economic system that, uh, favors things over people, at least in this very moment. So placing caretaking in the center of life or at the center of life, again, is to, to allow us to recover our humanity. It's like going against all system that capitalism is pushing us or want us to go because it's not remunerated almost ever and, and allows us to connect with each other. And it, it's generosity, pure generosity that and rewarding and something rewarding. But also it's, it's I like to think uh, about humanity as a species among others. And if you see the other mammals attitude or behavior, you will, if you take a look at them, you will see that, that all mammals are, take care of the others, not just, they, they take care of the children or of their cubs in, in a very collective way, but also they take care of the elder in that same collective way. And it's not just females, that enter into that movement, but also males. Let's think about the wolves, 
for instance, or the elephants or the dolphins. The other day I saw a video of a dolphin saving a little dog that fell down from a boat. It was on Instagram. I don't know if you saw it. At some point you will find it. And I was telling, asking to myself, why, why is the dolphin doing this? Why is, or what, what's going on? It, the dog doesn't even belong to the same species. It's not part of, of its um, pack at all. And it's, it's like in our nature and it, it makes us very happy when we manage to, to stop everything and take care of someone for I, even 20 minutes, give someone our attention for 20 minutes. It's very rewarding. And I have this question, I don't have the answer. Why do we enjoy that so much? I think it connects us to our very essence as, as just sentient beings, not even say humans. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love all the connections to the animal kingdom in, uh, in the book. And, and I do think that one of the things that makes the stories, the story of these two characters, um, Marlene and Doris, so powerful is that they are you know, they're, they're, at first they seem like very marginal characters. Doris is the neighbor, you know, Laura doesn't even really like her, um, but she feels this, this, you know, compulsion to, to help her in some way. Um, and Marlene, the, the, the nanny, Alina hates her at first, but, you know, gradually comes to have some sort of, you know, um, compassion and, and, and feeling of, of caring for her and taking care of her in the same way that, that, um, that Marlene is taking care of Ines. Um, so I love that. And I think you touched on this a little bit already in your, uh, in the answer that, or, you know, in what we were just talking about, but um, although the novel is not a philosophical manual in any sense, I did feel that it took an ethical and even radical stance on human connection. And, you know, as you're saying, you know, prioritizing human connection, um, Suggest and suggesting that we have as much responsibility for friends and even people who come into our lives by chance as we have for our children, partners, or blood relations. Um, and maybe you've kind of already answered this. So if you think so, we can just move on to the next question. But um, but I have noticed that in your earlier novels too. So I think it's an important thing. It's an important theme for you. Um, uh, so how do you think about family and community in this novel and more broadly? I. I I feel very lucky to witness uh, huge changes in the way we face family now, nowadays in the 21st century. When I was a child, it was just like father and mother and then the children living together. And that was the natural thing or considered the natural thing. And nothing else was natural. And nowadays, my children are used to see all kinds of family, <laughs> like, um, I don't know, two mothers or two fathers raising a child and also separated and re reconstitute <laughs> families. I don't know how you say that in English, reconstituted. Yes, yes. Okay. Reconstituted, yeah. And... So that's beautiful because we are investigating. Of course, they will, they may say in the future that they were like guinea pigs and they're not so happy with that or something. They will, they will always complain. We always complain. I also complain about my <laughs> own family and what they did and the decisions they took. But it's very interesting from a part at least to see from the distance what we are doing and what we are looking for. And there's also, I think that again, if you if we look at the at, at the mammals, when when the mammals are in in free their freedom, they're they're not in captivity, they behave like that. If you take a big cat, for instance, or a wolf, they will always be in packs and helping each other and doing things together. And if you look at small cats or dogs, which are wolves in captivity, they don't behave like that anymore. So it's like we were, we were behaving like that many centuries ago. We found that, that that system, the collectivity worked for many, many years. And then we entered in a kind of captivity 
with uh, industrialization, capitalism, and and how we we went to live in the small in in the very very large cities in small apartments apart from from the rest of the family or the pack and isolated actually. So I think that we have to recover that freedom, the freedom. And also I was I wanted to say that caretaking is also right, not only a burden, it's also it can it can be a, a right seeing as that and, and many men were de deprived of that. And they have to they have to recover the right of, of taking care of others as a normal practice. And that would be against the, the violence mandate or masculinity, masculinity, traditional masculinity mandate that deprives them to having that pleasure and that honor to take care of someone that you really love. So yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to witness all this conversation that is going on in many places about caretaking. I wanted to be part of that, of course. I really like the idea that men have been deprived of caretaking. It's not that they should be doing better and they should be trying harder, but that in fact, they've been deprived and they should, you know, they could enjoy caretaking. And, and, um, and, and I think you're right that we do get something, you know, um, very satisfying from taking care of other people. And uh, why not? Why shouldn't everyone participate in that? Not just, you know, and mm -hmm. not and all the pressure not be just put on women. Um, let's see. So, you know, talking about the conversation, um, you know, about around family and community, there has been a lot of conversation lately, literary conversation about uh, motherhood and about mothers and children. Um, and I'm wondering whether there were other books in particular that you were reading um, that were on your mind as you were writing the novel or that you've read since with special interest. Um, some of the books that I was thinking of, although I admit that I haven't read most of them, um, are Rivka Galchen's Little Labors, Jathmina Barrera's Linea Negra, Katisha Aguirre's Mothers Don't, Sheila Hedy Motherhood. Um, and I'll, you know, although I haven't read most of them, I feel that I have followed the conversation around them, and I'm wondering whether you have, and whether that's whether you feel that your novel is in dialogue with other conversations. Sure, it's kind of um, I don't know. It's trendy to speak about motherhood right now, but actually, it's not a, a new thing. Many women have been talking about that for very, very long, like Annie Arnaud, which in the sixties was writing um, the, um, the event, I think it's translated into English, which is um, about her, her story. It's a biographical novel where she talks about an abortion she, has to, she had to practice when she was very young and the way it was seen by the society and the way it was forbidden everywhere in France and considered like, um, yeah, you had you go you, you could go to prison for doing that, as it's again the case in some places. So and when she published that beautiful, astonish, astonishing book, the critics said, oh, nobody cares about these women's, you know, like stuff. And why is she speaking about that? It, it should be private. And now after many decades, it, 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 become, it became a, a trendy book. And also many others like uh, Jane Lazar's Mother Not and uh, Simone de Beauvoir and others, Rosario Castellanos as well. So um, it's something that is, it's like feminism because it's at the center of the feminine experience, you know? It's, being a mother or not changes your whole life. If you decide not to be a mother, because for at least for many, many decades, you have the, the reprobation and, and you know the judgment of all the society, your fa family and everything, you have to be a real rebel to, to decide not to be a, a mother for ages. 
and also being a mother we know what all that all that it takes so it is at the center of the feminine experience for sure so many many writers went into that topic for years now it's it's finally getting like an audience which i celebrate and also i i wanted while i was writing this novel at the beginning i just want to write about my friends experience and and being like a witness of that and then i found out that i was speaking a lot about motherhood but also i wanted to speak about the ties between mothers and daughters and the fact of being a daughter as well so i read books like fierce attachment by um vivian gornick and also um Annie Arno, who speaks about that in in the novel about her mother in fam so yeah that was the topic that really really i don't know i i, I read many books like that for a while <laughs> that's excellent um and i think that we're it's almost time for me to take questions from the audience in fact i think it is time but um since i am a translator i feel that i can't let you get away without asking one translation question um and you know just generally how was the translation process and and how much did you participate in it or how much do you normally participate in your in the translation of your novels um and also specifically i've heard that there was some disagreement around the translation of the title which in spanish um uh, is is la hija única which has a double meaning um it can mean either the only daughter or it can mean the unique or the singular daughter you know daughter no one else is like this daughter and then in english it, it mm. is of course stillborn um which also has a double meaning but a different double meaning yeah so no there was not like a real disagreement we had a very rich conversation about that it's, it's strange for me because you know i i read english and i enjoy a lot reading english literature but i'm not able at all to write in english and sometimes it gets really frust frust frustrating because you know that something is not exactly like you want you would tell it but it's also and you know it's it it doesn't correspond and you have to let it you know go and and acknowledge the fact that someone is is rewriting your story and um and doing putting all all her heart in doing that so it's nice to have a, a close relationship I have a, I have still a close relationship with my translator and at some points we were not in the same uh, frequency or tune and then and but I think that the only result can be positive because at the end the more you discuss about something the more you know you think about something the, the the beautiful the result is i think i'm very happy with with what she did well i always think it's amazing how much trust the writer has to have in the translator i mean um yeah i i think it must be really difficult to look at your text in someone else's um version but um but at the same time, I love that you're so engaged in the process because that's not always the case. Um, so <laughs> with that, I don't know, sometimes I feel like a control, you know, a free con control freak or something. But <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad I don't speak many languages, you know, or I can't read many languages like Bulgarian or I don't know Korean. <laughs> it's great just to trust and <laughs> let the others do whatever. But I also enjoy it, and I enjoy that process too. So it's um it 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 makes me reflect and yeah reflect and think a lot about what I I you know wrote, and that's beautiful. Sometimes well, you want to change the novel at the last minute, you know, like okay, in English the end will be different. <laughs> well, I've had, you know I've worked with writers who have changed things in the translation, so yes, I know that I know how that works. Um, and I, there are so many other questions I could ask you about that. I'm curious about your 
you know, how you, your involvement with the French translations, because I know that your French is very good. But I won't ask that. I will look at some questions from the audience here. It looks like maybe most of the questions are actually in the chat. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, well, here, I'll look at the ones that are in the Q&A first. So there is a question from Anne Fox. She says, do you have personal experience with disability? Your empathy in this book, as well as in El Cuerpo and Que Nací, is so strong. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I think I have a personal experience with disability. I was born with um, a blind eye. I, I still, I'm still uh, blind with this uh, from this eye, and it gave me a lot of trouble, caused me a lot of troubles and problems when I was a child, especially because I had to put a patch on the one that could see just because my parents and the doctor, the doctors wanted to see if I could develop some sense of vision in the other. And I had to go to school like that. So that's something, that's an experience I tell in the body where I was born. And that made me very sensitive to the, to the theme or to the subject, to the matter. And also, um, yeah, I, I've been witnessing uh, families like that. There are many families with neurological conditions and, and disabilities. And at some point, um, like 20 years ago, they, people were hiding that. I think that uh, little by little, society has developed more an openness and, you know, gen you know, acknowledging of them and and that's something that it's not generous as as it never is it's something that ha they have a right that they have achieved and definitely uh, there there's another book called um, petalos but in english it's translated as pesoar where i also speak about other disabilities which are very inspiring for me because I think that these people are unique, as I told in the title of La Hija Unica. It's, it's beautiful how to, the, the way they have to straw. I mean, it's it's not something that I wish to anyone, but it but it's beautiful to witness how they they struggle and they they open, you know, like their ways and paths to the world and teaches us a lot as well as Ines have done. Yeah. The next question is from Greg Cantor and he, uh, he says, thank you for your work and for this wonderful conversation. At what point on hearing your friend's story did you know you wanted to write this novel? Not at the beginning. At the beginning I was like totally shocked and trying just to be by the, her side and not knowing even what to tell to her. And it's when I saw how she managed to get her out from desperation and isolation and, you know, like suffering and, and transform it, as I said before, into something beautiful and meaningful that I said, oh my God, she's a, she's a true hero. And I want to share that to everyone. And also you were asking uh, why did I decided to, to put her name right in the beginning? It's because I wanted everyone to know, you know, who she was, her name, and, and also to, to say thank you to her because she, I think it's very beautiful some, the, the fact that she, had, she allowed me to write the story, participate in it, and also um, allow me to invent. She was telling me all the time, make this story yours. It's yours now. So you can heal every one of us if you want. You can do whatever you want with us. Just invent whatever you feel like. And that was so generous. You must have had some amazing conversations with her. Um, yeah. You know, that reminds me that I wanted to ask you, how old is her daughter now? She's five years old and she's going to school. And of course, not in the way that 
all the children go, but also she's she's connecting with other children and she the other children play with her. And I think it's beautiful, not only because she enjoys that, but also because all the other children are, are seeing her as as someone natural, you know, as something, as someone that that can exist and has rights as well. And they will feel a lot of, they will feel related and they will love her. And the next time it will, they will find someone like her in the streets or in the movies or in a doctor's room or wherever, they will, re, this person will remind her of Ines and they will feel empathy and acceptance instead of, of frightened or fear, you know, which happens many times because we are not used, this, these people are hidden normally, which I find awful, and they will behave naturally, which is what everyone wants, actually. So, yeah, that's so beautiful. And I, I wish I could also tell that. Maybe there will be... Um, a chapter added. <laughs> I'm joking, but maybe when <laughs> maybe when it's translated it into a new language, another language. <laughs> um, I just have a question for the moderators. There are a couple more questions. Do I have time to? Can I keep going a little bit? I think you can, Natasha. Okay. So there's a question from Joe Norris, and he says, "I know this is a big question, but what has changed when a book is translated from its original language?" Is something lost or does it become something different? Mm -hmm. Also, in a translated work, how much of the prose can be attributed to the original author versus the translator? I think you, you answered that a little bit already. Okay. Do you want to say something as the translator? Um, well, you know, I mean, I'm curious in your perspective on it as, as the writer, but... Um, I don't know. I mean, I think almost all of it is still the writer. Um, and I mean, hopefully I'm not, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is um, make it as eloquent as it can possibly be in a new language. But what I'm trying to make eloquent are the things that you wrote or, you know, what the things that the writer wrote. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of skill and a lot of craft involved in that, but I don't think, but I think that the whole purpose of all of that skill and craft is to try to go as deep as possible into the book that, um, that the writer has written. I don't, I, I mean, I don't, maybe, I, I doubt that any translator feels this way, but I, I you know, I, the point is not for me to impress myself on, <laughs> on the book in any way. Although I've been translating for a little while. I haven't I have translated some short stories from French into Spanish. And I feel it's it's a collective work actually. It's, I couldn't have written this story without my friend Amelia. I couldn't have written this story without, you know, like all the mothers that told me their stories like that. And and also it it wouldn't it it would have never been um, the same without some friends that read the, the book before it was published. And also, of course, a translator has a very, very important part in the, in the thing. It's not like we writers are often very selfish. I know that I, <laughs> just, I'm aware of that, but we have to acknowledge that it's the a book, it's a collective work the publisher, the editor, of course, the translator, and everyone is participating in that. And that's why it, it's so precious, I would say. Um, I think that the last question is for me. It's from James McGurk. He says, this question is for the moderator. He says, our first daughter passed from SIDS at four months. I took her to the hospital thinking she was alive. Our son had a horrible accident at age seven and passed to age 25. My question, you said men should take more into raising a child. Not sure if you meant all men or did you have a bad experience? I can't tell you how much I put into the child rearing. Um, and I'll you know, just answer briefly and say that, um, of course, I never meant to suggest that men are not, cannot also be you know, wonderful caregivers. My, my partner is an amazing dad. Um, um, but I think that there has been, a presumption that women 
would be in charge of a lot of the little things that go into raising children. Um, and um, and I love and I love the fact that that's changing and that a lot of men are reconsidering their role in these relationships. Yeah. And I guess we will leave it there. That's the last question. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natasha. And thank you everyone who attended this. And I hope you enjoyed the book. <laughs> thank you, Guadalupe. That was such a great conversation. That was incredible. I could listen to the two of you for hours. Thank you so much. Um, it's a real honor and a joy to have you both. The book came out yesterday. It's in every great independent bookstore you can imagine, including the five here tonight. Um, I encourage you to go pick up a copy and get reading. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Pierce. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs>